Hey, and welcome to the Reset Podcast. Everything you need to know that your therapist probably never told you. Researched by experts, real life experiences. This is Reset. It's that time of year, and all my little kiddos are getting excited. And by kiddos, I mean seniors in high school. You can call them kiddos. I call them my kiddos because they are getting word back from college. And some of them... Big are, envelope, small envelope. I oh, wait. They, no. It's all online now. I try to tell them this. Oh my I gosh. try to tell them back in our day, the big envelope mean you're in. Yep. Then you get the small envelope and not get in. How many, how many colleges did you apply to? I applied to, I think, five or six. And you got on, you got into... Five. I am. I didn't get into one. Harvard. Westmont. Bestmont. Because my, I told you my ACT SAT scores were horrible, but I had a three point nine GPA. Three point nine GPA. So I had three point GPA in college in high school, and my, you know I got my SAT. Yeah, I think we've talked about this. Six ninety on my first one. And then took it a second time, aced it with a 780. <laughs> I did better on the ACTs than the SATs. So the ACTs is what got me into like the other colleges. These are just so much different. My parents didn't even know how to spell SAT back in the day. Like they just, I just went, they dropped me off. Actually, thank God I had a baseball coach that's like, you need to take your SATs. It's second semester. Oh my gosh. Second semester of your senior year. You got to figure your life out. Wait, yours didn't matter because you went to junior college. Well, because obviously with my scores, I had to take my talents to junior college for yes, sure. Bring those talents One hundred percent, because I know I was going to transfer or yeah. go to it for a year. But now these kids are like, I'm telling you, they're they're all taking private SAT, ACT. Mm-hmm. They're all just acing it like no one's problem. It seems to be this theme of to get into a really good college, you need way over a four point oh, really good test scores extracurriculars, sports, all these things. However, I just applied to Christian private schools, except for Fullerton. My mom was like, just do one that's not a private school just to see, you know, or whatever. But, I mean, now it's – the competition's insane. Well, I remember sitting down my sophomore year with your with my parents, and it was like at nighttime with the academic counselor at your high school. And I remember thinking to myself, Cause like, where do you like to go to school? And and I, I remember telling my dad, like, man, I think, I mean, I like Stanford baseball. I want to go to Stanford. <laughs> and I remember him telling me, I'll quote him, son, you're, you're just not Stanford material. And I, I, I had no idea what that even meant. Now I'm like, now I know what he's talking about. But I think so many kids now do so much preparation for colleges. They have the private, now they have private college coaches, which – prepare you, help you with your essays and grade them for you and make sure that they're prepared for it. Then you have tier one, tier two, tier three colleges that they set you up with. So instead of applying to five, you apply to almost 20 of them and you have your guarantees and you have your state schools and then you have your ones that are kind of a reach. And so it's more of a system around it. Mm-hmm. And then they figure out, okay, what do you need for scholarships? And they prepare you for that in line, you positioning that starting now it used to be junior year, second semester. Now it's really sophomore year is where a lot of them prepare for it. And I have a few clients their freshman year. They meet with these college, co- these college coaches to get things going. And it reminds me of getting married, where so many people spend all this time, energy, and money on the wedding day and no energy and time preparing for the rest of their life with that person. Ouch. And, and so the byproduct of it is, Great preparation for a great party, but when it came to marriage, there wasn't a lot of success. And I think I've seen the same thing now in the last five years where all my kiddos do so much preparation to get into a school, and the amount of them that after first or second semester, they end up coming home because they're not prepared mentally, emotionally, even physically for college, they just can't do it. And they come back home and go back to junior college, which is nothing wrong. Let's just start this out. There's nothing wrong with JUCO. JUCO made me to the man I am today. Did you just make that up? No, it's called JUCO. Junior college is JUCO. If you go, those who understand, see, this is what I'm talking about. 
You went to a prestigious <laughs> college, and you don't know what JUCO means. It was prestigious. At it all. was prestigious college that you went to, and you're refusing to hear the <laughs> junior college language. I don't want to hear from you, lower class. People. Yes, as JUCO, you know, I only went three years. I had a friend that I think he went six years, mm. seven years. That's okay. It's JUCO <laughs> is, is a great place to land for a lot of people. But here's the, the cons- black hole for a lot. Yeah, of it is. I actually call it the black hole if you can't. If you don't have a plan, out. you have you to. Have you a plan. gotta have a plan, or you can't get out of it. Yeah. But I think here's what I've realized, and it sounds odd, but there is certain preparations. I feel like, and I talk to my clients about this. Like you need to do this before, or learn certain things before you go away to college. And a large part of it, I think we learn, just part of our, I think just the culture that we lived in during the 1900s. That's just not being done anymore. So, for example, one of – I know this is going to sound weird. You're like, Joe, you're crazy. I'm not joking when I tell you this. Is you have to – if you're going to go to college, if you're going to send your kid to a fifty to $75,000 a year college, out of state, over an hour away, whatever it may be, please prepare them by the following things. Number one, teach them how to do laundry. Mm-hmm. Sounds weird. An independent just – the sense of independence comes from it and learning it. The amount of my clients that cannot figure out laundry or the parents pay for a laundry service in college is tremendous. The amount of them that ask me in session, my clothes smell, what am I supposed to do? And a lot of them just buy more clothes or underwear. And I'm not making this up. I kind of want to go back to, wait, we could hire someone to do a laundry service? There's a laundry service at universities where they go and you put everything in a bag. You put it outside your dorm room. They come, pick it up. They clean it and fold it for you. What about like We should try that for (laughs) I don't think you're ready to be a a housewife. I think that's what you're telling me. There's a simple thing we need to do. It's my least favorite chore but no i know what you're saying there or so many yeah so many kids that don't know how to do it they, they don't know how to do it they don't they can't figure it so out So basically you're going to give us a list right now of independence like kind of i, I just think, think what, i just think if your kid can't do these certain things there's things to be a not a correlation but a causation of them not doing well coming back the first year okay so i think learning that which i think we all learned that i learned that age 12 right laundry Number two is getting up on their own for school without the assistance of a parent. Yeah, this blows my mind how many people in high school still that mommy and daddy like have to get them out of bed. It blows my mind the amount of kids who – we're going to the, another one, which is they have to have better than like 90% attendance at school. Because mm. a large part about college, you're paid to play. And these are the college I teach at. You cannot miss more than 3% of your classes or you're automatically drop of the F. Hmm. So attendance ma- matters, right? And so the inability to, for you to wake up on your own and you need a parent to wake you hmm. up, if that is happening during your junior and senior year, I think we have a problem, Captain. Oh, gosh. I My mom made me get up on my own. I want to say starting fourth, fifth grade. I had a radio, what do you call it, alarm? Old school. Old school. And it was across the room, so I had to get out of bed to turn it off. And, you know, I don't, I don't know. It was never a problem in my house because it was never – it was just you get your butt out of bed and get ready for school. School just wasn't an option. <laughs> Missing school wasn't an option, should I say. <laughs> school was definitely not an option. Definitely not an option if you yes, want your parents you to, to go to jail. Yeah, I mean, That's right. Well, which is why I, I think State of California made it illegal to basically miss certain amount of school days. But right. if you cannot do that – and so many kids cannot do it, they go to college – and they just end up dropping classes or failing classes because they couldn't show up. Wow. Because they, That's and crazy. they, and the parents realize, oh my gosh, the kid couldn't get up without me being there. We just thought it was going to happen in, co- in college. It just doesn't. Turn Although around. I did have a roommate who is one of my best friends to this day who could, we could not wake up so many times because she was the heaviest sleeper. Like we we I poured. Say something else. Oh, Sorry. We, we would like pour cold water on her face. Like it was crazy how much she really could. I mean, there are some rare cases out there. We get it. Like you're a deep sleeper, but for the most of y'all, like, I mean, how kids have phones now too. There's like no excuse. But yet somehow they're, there's Although, a tremendous issue. Never mind. Good parents won't allow their kids to have phones in their room, so it will have to be a clock radio, I guess. 
You could just be a standard alarm. Don't it do this clock radio? You're obsessed. <laughs> Once again, I didn't have the money to get a clock radio. Yes, that was me. I'm just saying simple things. Get up in the morning time. Yeah. Then learning and not just get up on their own, but also go to school on time. Yeah. The amount of kids who cannot get up for their first period and be on time and parents who allow them to skip that first period. The lesson being taught there, I'm telling you, translates completely into college where kids feel like, oh, I'm tired right now. I'm going to skip this class. Mm -hmm. Just snowballs them mm -hmm. long term and just creates such bad habits. This is like something that you and I talked about when our kids are at the age of junior high and high school. We are going to definitely battle wisely. But the one thing we're going to battle is them learning to get up on their own, get to school on time, mm -hmm. the ability to, I'm tired, I don't want to go. No, you're, you got to go to school. Right. Because we talked about this in our school avoidance episode where it's just so easy where these bad habits can really just turn into, unfortunately, wasted money in college. You speaking about bad habits made me think of another thing that kids need to be equipped with. And this is stop enabling in the respect of your kid forgets something stop bringing it to school once they're like eighth grade and above to some point maybe seventh so my I would forget my flute almost every week and my dad because he worked so close to my school and I lived pretty close to school he would drive all the way home get my flute and bring it to me my mom had to finally be like stop she needs to learn like feel the weight of our consequence because I'm not getting it because you would get like marked down like and I was a good student like I would just freak out at that idea and so I remember calling him one time from the office and being like dad I forgot my flute and he's like sorry kiddo can't bring it and I was like cried I mean I was so upset but guess how many times I forgot my flute after that maybe once or twice in the lot in the next like, two years of junior high because I felt the weight of that consequence. So I think there's so many little things like that that parents still show up. I mean, when they're elementary school, it can be different. Like, you know, you, you don't want – your kid forgets his lunch. Like, I get it. But, like, there's a certain point where they have to start realizing I have responsibilities to get through my day, quote, unquote, to get ready for work then when I'm older, to get ready to go to you know, college when I'm older. So that's another thing I just thought of, of responsibilities. This is the part of the show where we talk about things from the past. Like the 1900s? Life was so much simpler back in my day. Like no cell phones or Netflix. Our phones were attached to a wall. Mickey Mouse Club saved by the bell. TGIF. Friend Seinfeld, Mr. Rogers, Care Bears, G.I. Joe. Shrinky Dinks, Cabbage Patch, Lincoln Log, Strawberry. I have no cake. idea what you're talking about, Nothing lady. Pain, he man, Ninja Turtle, Slinky, Silly Putty. Cue cheesy music. You know, sport, today wasn't easy. And overall, it took you a while to make the right decision, but you did. And I'm really proud of you. I see what you're doing there. I see what you're doing there. You are bringing up every show in our childhood and before where they have a moral. Always have that moral at the end. Here's the thing. The list goes on. I mean, our personal favorites, Full House, Family Matters, Step by Step, Boy Meets Andy World. Andy Griffin Show, I Love Lucy, even Gilligan's Island, for heaven's sake. It's true, Saved by the Bell. They all ended with this cheesy music coming in to play. And then the moral or the theme of the episode was exposed in case you missed it the whole 20 minutes you were watching they made yeah, sure yeah. you point. knew just what in it case was. you were the person not understanding the moral of the, the moral of this episode right. let me just smack you in the face with it yes exactly i remember to this day even the cosby show and the cosby show had an episode where you can have a look it was I bill cosby we I, well the cosby show. well just track with me theo okay. was the sun statement theo's like why can't I do what I want? Why don't I just, you guys do nothing for me. And he's just going off on the parents. And so then the dad was like, okay, we won't do anything for you. And he's like, great. I don't want you guys' help. Mm. The next day he's like, oh, wait, where's my, I'm getting some breakfast in, at the at the kitchen. And dad's like, no, that's yeah. our food. And then he's like, what? And he's like, let me help you out. And the dad gives him monopoly money. So let's pretend this is real money. He's like, great. And then he takes like a third of it for rent and then this much for a car payment. Like, and basically it was just a moral of us children to be thankful 
for our parents to give us, it still sticks with me to this day. Yeah. See, it left an imprint on your 100%. heart. 100%. 100%. I remember, remember watching Annie Griffin a few months ago, and there's an episode about Arnold. Don't be an Arnold. Don't be an Arnold. And tell Ar- that to our kids. You're right, because Arnold in the episode ends up being what we call a turd monkey, which is in our family. Which <laughs> Caught is, in the head in any muggin. Yeah, he complains. He lo- he fake cries to get his way. In the end of the episode, uh, well, let's just say the, the dad probably gets him an old school spanking. But... The point of the episode, which our kids know, is don't be an Arnold. Arnold's are very annoying. Mm-hmm. And it brings us such great conversations versus today's TV shows where we mm-hmm. watch other kids. We had to create a moral for our kids at the what end of it. What do you think that episode was yeah. about? Or at times, like the kind of the whiny one gets rewarded at yeah. times. And the one that's actually like moral or accurate or good, whatever you want to call it, mm. ends up not being kind of the the good one or the cool one. You know, though, what we loved about Modern Family is that was the first show in years that we had seen that feeling of that moral principle coming in at the end where it was the character sitting on the couch. A lot of the times it was the grandpa slash dad, like, who would give that moral. Uh, But it wasn't always. And he would talk about, you know, kind of this sweet life lesson. And then we thought it was interesting. It kind of went away for a season or two. And then it came back. Uh, which we were glad to see because it just was this feeling of nostalgia and, again, uh, to have a mo- a modern huh, – funny, modern family mm-hmm. – modern show, again, like a relevant show doing what we did when we were kids. It was – I don't know. It was kind of a sweet feeling. Well, here's why I think it was great for us to see it and we realize we're missing it in the last 20 years is because I think we all could relate to moral. And I think we all want to be moral and we want morals with our family, we want morals with our children. We want morals in our own life. Mm -hmm. I also think that a large part of even movies and TV shows, but I know we're talking about mainly TV shows, is they miss this purity aspect of it. There's no purity. You have to be cautious about your kids are watching, to be cautious about what Mm -hmm. is happening, what we're seeing. And we see that a lot, even with adult shows. And the purity of it is just not there anymore. Right. And we had the purity of it. That's why we have no fear watching Annie Griffin show with mm-hmm. our kids. I love how one of the episodes was literally about the Sabbath, just resting for a full day. It was the whole episode. And how much as us, we were like, oh, man, we kind of feel a little conviction here. Yeah. But it's all about having these shows that represent the ideal mm-hmm. for us as a reminder of what we're trying to shoot for. In our own lives, but also to create correction within our own, mm-hmm. and yet still was entertaining. Well, and when you watched television, especially we're talking family shows specifically. Totally. You knew you were watching something that was either going to teach, inspire, encourage, or uh, like um, everything positive, meaning there could have been something negative that happens in that show. But in the end, the character learns from it. So you you knew probably as a parent back then, because we were kids back then, that you know your your family sitting down to watch these programs. <laughs> my grandma used to call them programs. Absolutely That's really funny. Uh, my program, Sean. Um, you had this feeling of, oh, we're gonna be uplifted watching this. We're gonna actually walk away with same things I've been telling my kids every single day. You know. Uh, Corey's mom is going to say in this episode. So you actually got this backup as a parent. You got this affirmation from, you know, this this show that you enjoyed. The characters going through similar things that you were going through as a kid or a teenager, and then seeing the parents respond in a healthy, good way. To where, as a parent, I'm sure you felt backed up, and as a kid, you did feel seen and understood to some point, and then kind of felt like, oh man, th- their mom and dad kind of do the same thing my mom and dad do. Well, do you remember in the 1900s, they had after school specials or movies that usually was about drugs, alcohol. Oh, yeah. And then they have these. Do you remember this? Like this Friday, a very special Family Matters. Oh, yeah. be like about racism. But they would give you a yes. heads up. Yeah, like a very special. And it's like, whoa, this one's going to be intense. Yeah. It's going in. You know, we're going all in with it. It's also why I think, and what we're trying to say here is, Great scripted TV shows, I think, are not present anymore, mainly because reality TV has taken over the last 20 years, and reality TV really doesn't develop or reveal its morals 
or what the moral of the story is. A lot of times we have to bring that in. I was thinking with a lot of my clients, they love the show Love Island. And they talk about Love Island. And it's just, you know, it is what it says. It's Love Island, which is totally different from the love boat back in the 1900s. I was just going to say, Love Island sounds so sweet. I am sure it's nothing sweet. It is the Bachelor on steroids. Debauchery Island. Yes. And every time they talk about it, when someone brings it up, I feel like I have to bring in the moral of that show, which is the aspect in which... We really were not made to have multiple partners, to have multiple partners in one day, or to date multiple people at once, because the byproduct of it is jealousy, hurt, hurt, yeah. guilt, shame. Like you see this in this in this show, and people are left crying and sad. But yet they people are not seeing the moral throughout the well, show. You want to know why? And this is actually kind of sad because I've said this before too that. Sometimes it's just fun to watch stuff like that to make fun of it. But then you realize this, these are like, this is sad if this is entertainment to us. A great example where sex sells and it works. And a lot of the shows that we watch in the 1900s were not driven by sex. Sex wasn't selling. I mean, if you look at it, Ricky and Lucy didn't sleep in the same bed. The first time we actually see a couple sleeping in the same bed on national television was the old school Ozzy and Harriet show. And they were married. And they were married. Before that, they were net. We they couldn't do. They couldn't see that. Same thing when it comes to like I Love Lucy show. The pre- they didn't want to see the presence of her being pregnant. Remember that? Oh yeah, that's right. And so they had to block that or not show that. Yeah. Because Which they that want- one is strange. It's but- just strange, but they just because they're airing on wanting purity because mm-hmm. they felt purity in the culture sold more than sex does. I think there was that big shift, and the byproduct of it is what we're seeing today. Mm-hmm. And what sells, especially since a lot of shows, as we found out, people keep saying, while she shows, while she shows. And the first episode always has to have some type of wild sex scene. Or nudity. You're right. But then you don't see the rest of the season just because they captivate you and they want it. And they captivate a lot of men to think, okay, when's the next one going to happen? I'm going to keep yeah. watching it. It's so sad. And I think we just need to have that purity back in what we watch again because it was – such good TV. Well, it's driven by story and characters. It's not driven by the actions. Like it's the meaning the, you know, the dialogue was was rich. Right. It's not driven by yeah the sex scene or the violent scene or the whatever it was. It was driven by you know, in well, their eyes. It's a lot was... of ways why we like sounds weird, but like why we like Hallmark movies. <laughs> it gives like this more purified movie. Right. You know how it's going to end. We know how it's going to end. We still have to watch it. Just like Gilgan's Island, too. Like, we all know how it ends. Well, they, they get, die? I'm just know, kidding. I'm teasing. They're on the island for 15 years, then they finally get saved by this major storm. Don't want to ruin it for people, but it's in the movie. Oh, my gosh. You just ruined it. But before that, no one gets off the island. No, it's true. Even though you never seen it before, and I grew up with it, and you watch it as an adult, you're so like... I get so frustrated. You get so frustrated. There's no way the professor knows all this. You know, I watch, I watch Andy Griffin show so much as a kid that we had this parrot, right? Just this bird that was in the bonus room where we would watch all of our TV. Like, you know, like in your house, you had that one TV, like no one had the TV in the room. It was just that one TV everyone watched. And we watched it so much, the Andy Griffin show, that one day I walked into the room and the bird started doing the whistle. He literally memorized that song. That's how catchy it was. That's actually because there was really good songs back in the day too, right? For you, you're like shows. the parrot in our house. I am constantly. I'm con- and the <laughs> and the parrot learned it. That's how much we saw. And that cra- come on, that is that's crazy. hilarious. I don't know. Let us know if you miss those sweet, corny, cheesy moments in TV shows, or are you so glad they're gone? And now back to the show. Well, I think part of this is a lot of we're talking about is parents letting go. And allowing consequences to to occur, natural consequences yes. to occur in life. I always feel like when kids are, especially the junior senior year, it's time to let them go, let them grow, and let them know. Like, let them know we're, we're kind of going to get a little hands off. Let them grow to make their mistakes, natural consequences, you know, mm-hmm. and then just let them go and just figure it out. Yeah. Which is also going with another concept I really feel needs to happen before they go away to college is, I, although this might not really matter, but it kind of does track me real quick. They need to learn how to do 
and make their own breakfast and lunch. Yes. The amount of kids who skip out on the cafeteria time and don't know what to do, and they spend all this money. I hear parents like, They're, we're spending so much money on Chipotle. We're spending so much money on Uber Eats. Kids need to learn just the respect of making your own food mm-hmm. and making it and making some things work. I'm, it's like, can you make a meal out of nothing? It, it reminds me of when I had to make my lunches every day starting my freshman year, so the night before, mm-hmm. the skill, right? And then I would make my own toast every morning, starting like in seventh grade. And just because that's what he did just for mm-hmm. – he wanted the independence. And so you would do that. But I remember some of my lunches – we're trying to make something out of nothing. It would be like the the gross cold hot dog oh my with gosh. like a – and you rolled like a – I know, a, a slice of bread. It was so gross. But then you realize it, it kind of made you get creative and figuring out That's what do you want to do. But I just think there's a sense, once again, helping the child becoming independent, autonomy mm-hmm. through certain actions and behaviors yeah. that can be carried over into college that will help them totally. to think ahead – Help them try to, you know, manage time management. Yes. That is so huge. Well, preparing the night before is a big one. Like you said, time management. Having your kids lay out their clothes, their lunches are packed, like all that stuff. You know, we, we've we implemented that with our younger kids. Like your clothes need to be laid out. I still make their lunches at this point. But, you know, I tell them they're all ready. They're in the fridge. We're all ready to go. And now they're kind of trying to learn to, like, grab it, put it in their bag, put their, you know, ice pack in, whatever it is. Um, slowly get to those places. Um, so they could be prepared for their day, set them up for success when they're not with you. So they know when their alarm goes off and then college, they already know exactly what they're going to wear. They they grab their backpacks already packed. Like there's no thinking, you know, did I print that paper? Well, yeah, I did it last night. Everything's prepared. But also just thought of another thing, job. Your kid oh. has to have some sort of job. Honey, I hate to say this, 95% of those teenage world that we live in don't Doesn't. have a job i can't handle that though i know I and mean, i but i i see you can see the ramifications of it in this generation because again if that's going back to showing up on time to having to um whatever it is like i don't know learning to submit to a manager learning to time manage when it comes to you're playing a sport and you got academics and you gotta go to to work the ability to say the ability to work out the muscle of, I have to say no to me me wanting to do something like play like video games, for example, and having to go and serve at Chipotle or mm-hmm. I keep on saying Chipotle. I like, know it's because I had a and, horrible experience with Chipotle say, two weeks ago. Chipotle's on your list I right now. I never write reviews ever. I don't care about because all bad reviews are all the reviews are bad. There's people who are just outliers. I find wrote a review. He did on Chipotle and this off this. I'm not going to name the street. But the reviews were one out of five. There's like hundreds of them. And let me just tell you, what's in the word Chipotle? First four letters. Chip. Chip. Three out of the four times, they ran out of chips by five o'clock. Yeah, it's true. How's that happen? And I quote them. I just work, work here, sir. Well, who am I supposed to talk to? The person who doesn't work here? <laughs> Chip is in the Chipotle. But then the wild part about it is they still charge me and they said they could not give me back my money. That was weird. This, okay, we don't want to talk okay, about it. Okay, we're not going to talk about it. That's weird but stuff. Here's what I'm talking about but, is yes. jobs help you to learn to deal with personalities like me when I don't get chips. Yes. Well, and it, I think it goes back to work ethic again. Confidence. And and learning how to work for something outside of yourself. You know, school you work on your whole life. So it's almost this like – it's just – it's not, and I want to say natural. It's just something that you've always had to do. You don't remember life without school. So then you add on a job with school and you realize, oh, it's a different kind of work. It's a different kind of showing up. So when you go to college, that it's such a different kind of schooling. You're picking your classes. It, it's so different even than high school because you could have an 8 a.m. class and you could have an 8 p.m. class. There's just all this margin of time and how do you make that flow right and so many things that I think you could learn from and benefit from having a job. But now 95% of teenagers made up statistic. But just knowing, like even you were saying, most of your teenagers don't work. That's crazy. They don't work. and But the ones that do, there's stuff in pride in them. You, and you recognize that they, they desire to kind of 
work for someone and create their own money. But I think that then they have a better, you know, respect towards money. Absolutely. They realize if you're, I mean, if you yeah. can pay for college, God bless you. Right. And you realize, wow, mom and dad are paying for this. I got to right. show up because you've had a job. You, right. you, you understand When you it. realize that your college costs you $50,000 and you're being paid maybe $15 an hour. I mean, there's a little more respect. They, there's better stewardship towards college. Mm-hmm. Here's another thing that kids need to start doing. Doing their own homework. Wait, let, excuse me? Let me talk about this. <laughs> so many, I'm sorry. So Do you many, have a secret? Yeah, so many teens, they, they use – here's what I'm hearing. They just take pictures of things and send it to everyone, and they just copy. Oh, actually, I did know yeah. this from second my thing, Right. Second thing <laughs> is – Everyone's using ChatGPT for all their mm. essays. I, I was having that problem in, in, in college. Yeah, when I was a professor. Yeah. You know, like that was happening tremendously. Actually, my TA told me it's about so it. Weird my TA is like, Joe, you know, this is happening. I'm like, this is wild. So I think it's awesome because that's the future. But whatever, move forward. But here's the other part I try and get to is, especially junior, senior year, because that's where I think the big turn needs to be. Show me proof that you can know what the homework assignment is. You can. Know when it is due. You could create like a work date for it. I mean, like when I'm going to accomplish it. Follow the instructions and do it on your own, because there's several people, even within their own family, who cannot even do certain papers or homework assignments. That if they can't do that, junior college is a great place to mm-hmm. learn how to do that. But if you, if the kid is able to do it, great. But they have to have the ability to have a sense of autonomy about their schoolwork, and if they have missing assignments they are having difficulty learning when turn things in on time or i can't seem to, oh, i must not upload it correctly to canvas or something like that it's going to be a long one year of college and it's going to be a rude awakening when it comes to realize professors really just don't care and i think it's good for us to let's say as parents and, and this kind of my advice and what we're going what we're going to do is be that external structure for these kids for homework, teach them how to create time management. And I actually believe you, you're just really there. You're you're involved in that process, highly involved in it, as much as they allow you to, all the way up to junior year. And I always tell my clients, I say, it's junior year now. It's time to let go and let them prove to you, like, I can start working out these muscles on my own. The external structure you've given me for the last 10 years of school has now developed and created this internal structure for me that I can start now using them on my own. And if you need help, invite me into that process. Mm-hmm. You know, parents, I'll invite you into that process. But it's a good time to say, look, this time next year, we're we're you know we're applying for colleges, and a year and a half, we're saying yes to colleges and to a commitment. You need to show us that. You can be a good steward of this time, your junior year and your first semester and senior year for us to sign that, that dotted line that says, let's go. You know, we're willing to invest and give you that best experience of being at a you know university and, and taking your talents to the next level. And I would just probably say lastly about this is, and I want to be sensitive to this, but also speak into is the aspect of if your child as a teenager, especially those last two years, is really struggling emotionally or mentally, high anxiety, anxiety attacks, depression, and that's con- still occurring throughout junior, you know, junior year, senior year, where it's just it's keeping them from attending school, it's keeping them from doing the the schoolwork, it's it's keeping them from maybe doing certain activities, social life, right that college becomes very lonely very quickly. Hmm. And college becomes a place where usually that gets exasperated. And a lot of my clients, instead of asking for help, they just uh, stop attending class and they just stay in their dorm room. And that becomes a very dark place for them. I was thinking about when I was working with um, with colleges that, I'm trying to remember what college was, but they were telling us that the number one cause of death for, for college students was dorm room hanging. So it was, at, I think it was 2000 and right before COVID 2018. And that's the number one cause of death for a, for a student athlete wow. was suicide. 
And I think that when things carry in, they're not, like we want those strategies to be taught and to be used before they go away to college. And it's good for that to happen. And even use as a, sometimes even a prerequisite saying, hey, we, we'd be willing to support you and pay for this money for college. But we're recognizing there's some days you can't get out of bed because you're depressed. There's some days that you're up super late at night because you're procrastinating, you have high anxiety, you're seeing anxiety attacks, and you're not having strategies. It is fine. In my book is, it's you could have, and we talked about this before, like strategies and tools and coping skills and be depressed and have them and still be functional and healthy. Like healthy people are depressed. Healthy people have dep- seasoned depression, and anxiety, things like that. But when kids go without any tools and strategies and skills, or let's say they don't have that support system, like a lot of my clients, I go with them into college and help them that transition. Mm-hmm. So they have that extra eyes and ears with them every week to make sure, hey, are you getting outside? Are you, doing, are you exercising? Are you make sure that you're mapping out your syllabus, where your due dates are, your work dates are going to be, are you taking class? Like making sure there's that extra accountability. If that's not put in place, a lot of times college exasperation reveals a lot more mental health issues. And then the kid feels like they're a failure and they feel more of like, I'm disappointment, loser, mm-hmm. fill in the blank. And they come back and they just feel really damaged from the experience. I'm really glad you said that because anxiety is definitely on the rise right now with teenagers. I think it's just really good to be aware as a parent how grave it is, how severe, you know, how how much they still maybe need you before going away to school and if their personality really is fit for that. And just remembering that still we are still are our kids' biggest supporters right now and cheerleaders to help them through this. And um, I know a lot of kids too want to use college as an escape and they get to college and again, weren't equipped. Or realizing that all that stuff comes with them. Yeah. Or it's like, I can't wait to just get away. Everything's going to be changed and better. I'm going to be so much better once I'm out of this house and I'm da 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 And I think college for majority, obviously, has been this great stepping stone and transition and growth spurt with growing pains to help them become from teenager to, you know, emerging adulthood to young adult. And then majority of kids take advantage of it. And it's great. And it's an awesome experience and friendships for life and skills that enhance their, you know, themselves and their opportunities and position themselves for great careers and, and to do the things that they love. Mm-hmm. And you just know when that kid has that, cause you really have no hesitations as a parent, a friend, you just know those kids, they just got it together. And then the ones that don't, I think air on this 50, 50 could go mm-hmm. either way. And if we don't have the practical life skills, which we're talking about right now, then it's probably not going to be a successful. It made me think about when I used to work for the County in for foster care that before a kid would age out to age 18 starting at age 16 it was mandatory in the county that these kids would do life skills classes where we taught them how to cook how to clean how to everybody needs that. i know how to do you know anywhere from doing dishes to doing laundry but also how to use a calendar how to use um you know recognize like you know how to use different things like even like excel spreadsheets like it was wild but part of our responsibility of the county to have these daughters and sons of the government was the county decided that we're going to teach them these life skills because age 18, at that moment, we let wow. go of them, which is yeah, not that way gosh. anymore in that in, in that county. But that's how it was. And these kids came away with life skills that they were hungry for, knowing I need to learn how to survive. And I think that we that stuff, it's like home ec back in the day. We need to bring back home ec. Bring it back. Bring it back. And I think so many kids, we could kind of do that mini boot camp for mm-hmm. four years of high school. I know you, it's cheaper for me to do their laundry for you, but I want you to learn how to do your laundry. I know it's better. I, I make way better meals and lunches, but I think it'd be good for you to practice this. Just creating and building those muscles of autonomy and independence in little ways will equivalent to life skills later on so again 
still see this as an exciting season with your teens. If they have applied to school and you're trying to figure it out, don't don't see this as a, oh my gosh, we didn't do teach every single lesson they just talked about. This is just more of an encouragement to remind you before, before you set them free, before they you know go in that real world, just make sure that they have a bag of tools and they are equipped. And let them know when they're not Stanford material. Thank you so much for being here and listening to the Reset Podcast. We're so glad that you joined us. If you enjoyed this episode, we want to hear from you. Can you leave us a review, a rating, or maybe even hit that subscribe button or share it with a friend that needs to hear it? We work with individuals, athletes, couples, and teams to overcome mental barriers that are holding them back from reaching their maximum potential. If that sounds like you, learn more about what we do at theresetgroup.com. We would love to connect with you on social media. So be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok at The Reset Group. See you next time.